Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Herron. I'm the director and chief executive of the Kansas City Public Library, and I want to both welcome and thank you for joining us this evening, whether you're here in the crowd or the many, many more watching via live stream. As this auditorium now attests, this is a special night with a special program and a most special guest. If you've been at any of our recent events, you've heard me talk about how public libraries have evolved, just as the needs of those we serve have also evolved. Of course, we still talk about literacy, about books, and about education. We are still a vital place for study and for research. But your library is also a vibrant hub of social services. We offer training and support to our fellow citizens who very often need it most. We offer access to the vital resources and services needed to make this city a success. We're also, perhaps more importantly than ever, a community center, a place for people to gather and to connect, a place to be exposed to different values and to be enlightened and enriched. For more than 15 years, that role has, has inspired our award-winning series of signature programs, notable authors, notable speakers, civic forums, and cultural presentations. We took a great deal of pride in continuing these events through the height of the COVID pandemic, though for nearly two years, what that meant was bringing these programs to you virtually. We have reopened our auditoriums, we have resumed our programming in person, and we have been immensely grateful because you have returned. Look around. Tonight, we are back in full. And we are so for very good reason. Candace Millard is with us to discuss her fourth book, River of the Gods. It is her fourth national bestseller. And she's with us in her hometown to celebrate. Kansas City has a proud literary heritage from Ernest Hemingway to Evan Connell to Calvin Trillin. Candace is clearly a significant part of that tradition. She is one of our all-time treasures. It might be hard to imagine then that fresh out of school, she broke in as a writer with a small trade journal, Veterinary Forum, um, <laughs> even though she will admit that at that point in her life, she'd never even had a pet. Um, she moved on to National Geographic as an editor and contributing writer, and then came the books, each one a critical and popular success. Candace, who lives with her family in Leewood, has a gift for writing new life into history, making it accessible to wide audiences. She did it first with Teddy Roosevelt's adventures in the Amazon, then with the assassination of President James Garfield, and in her third book with Winston Churchill in the Boer War. And she does it again in River of the Gods with the British explorers Richard Burton and John Speke and an overlooked third member of, the, of their fraught 19th century search for the source of the Nile, a former East African slave named Sadari Mubarak Bombay. Well, as the New York Times wrote in their review of her latest work, she is a graceful writer and a careful researcher. She knows how to navigate a tangled tale. We in the public library could not agree more. And with that assessment, we are honored to have her with us tonight. For the rest of our run of show, Candace will spend about 25 minutes talking about her book, which she spent more than five years researching and writing. And then she will be joined by the library's own Anne Knigendorf for questions and discussion. We've been fortunate to have Anne at the library as a writer and editor for almost a year. She's an author of two books herself and discussed the second book, Kansas City Scavenger, on this very stage last month. When we move into the question and answers, we ask everyone here to use the microphones that we'll put at the, at the top of the aisles. Viewers at home can submit their questions anytime during the presentation uh, via the YouTube live chat box. And for those of you who have purchased Candace's book tonight or brought a copy with you, She'll remain on stage after the presentation to sign them. Now, please join me in welcoming my friend, Candace Millard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. It's such an honor to be here. It's an honor to be introduced by John Heron, a good friend of mine and someone I admire a great, a great deal. Um, and I am a personal product of libraries, as I know so many of you are. And um, 
I just want to say how grateful I am to libraries in general and to the Kansas City Library System specifically. I've, I've spent the last 20 years bringing my children here and personally benefiting from everything that they offer our community. So big, big thanks to the library and, and thank, thank you to all of you for coming. For more than a thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire, the leaders of the European world assumed that Greek and Roman culture represented the pinnacle of human achievement. They taught their children and priests and scientists to study Greek and Latin. They venerated Greek and Roman writing and art. And they even tried to recreate the glories of Athens and Rome. Then, at the end of the 1700s, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone unlocked the even older secrets of ancient Egypt, setting off a century-long political and scientific scramble to discover and claim the legacy of the pharaohs and, ultimately, the continent of Africa. Of course, you could not have Egypt without the Nile, the longest and most storied river in the world, which made possible one of the oldest and richest continuous, continuous civilizations in history, bringing life to the Egyptian desert on its more than 4,000 mile long journey to the Mediterranean Sea. The question was, where did it begin? It was a tantalizing, maddening mystery that for millennia had captivated and frustrated Everyone from ancient philosophers to Greek historians to Egyptian kings, each determined to find the river's source and with it, the presumed origin of human wisdom and learning. This book is a story of that epic quest, which forced its participants to overcome some of the most forbidding obstacles and hostile conditions in the history of Western exploration. It required traveling more than a thousand miles into the heart of Africa, which Europeans had never penetrated or understood. It tested the limits even of the mighty British Empire with all of its growing power and resources. And it meant enduring terrifyingly strange, crippling diseases, near starvation, and attack from local peoples prepared to defend their land against uninvited, and ultimately dangerous intruders. More than anything else, however, this is a story about the best and the worst of human beings. It's about the heights of human achievement, the enormous limitations of human understanding, and the familiar, tragic costs of envy, betrayal, and personal ambition. In a very real sense, the entire idea of discovering a continent on which millions of people lived was an exercise in vanity and parochialism. Even more pronounced was the degree to which the search became dominated and identified with the individuals who led it, whose all too recognizable failings and conflicts would make it a lasting example of personal rivalry, and ultimately, personal loss. I won't tell you the story today. I'll leave that to the book. But let me draw the outlines of the places and the people that made it irresistible to me. Let's begin in the hallowed halls of one of Britain's most esteemed institutions, the Royal Geographical Society. Founded in 1830, the Royal Geographical Society quickly became the country's most powerful scientific society, counting among its members Britain's most venerated scientists and explorers, from Charles Darwin to David Livingston. In the 1850s, determined to take the lead in the battle for the timeless treasures of Egypt and the land of Africa, Britain relied largely on the Royal Geographical Society. In turn, the society resolved to mount one of the most complex and demanding expeditions ever attempted. Rather than begin in the north and attempt to ascend the river, as so many had tried and failed to do for millennia, 
they would begin on the east coast of Africa, well below the equator, and proceed inland in search of the elusive source of the Nile. It had long been known that the Nile was made up of two primary branches, the white and the blue. The white, named for the light gray silt that gives its waters a milky hue, is longer and joins the darker blue Nile near Khartoum in Sudan. A Spanish Jesuit had discovered the source of the Blue Nile, Lake Tana, in northern Ethiopia in 1618. But more than 200 years later, the source of the White Nile remained a mystery. In those 200 years, there was a great deal of discussion and debate about the White Nile, but very little progress, until 1855, when the society received an exceedingly strange map of East Africa. Drawn by two German missionary explorers, the map was notable for a single feature, an enormous inland sea that was so strangely shaped that even the most experienced geographers struggled to describe it. Eventually, it just became known as the slug map. <laughs> but it caused an immediate stir among gentlemen scientists and armchair geographers and it gave a sudden sense of urgency to finding the source of the White Nile. The society quickly formed the East African expedition and began looking for the right man to lead it. Few men were as qualified to lead an expedition as Richard Francis Burton. Burton was already an incredibly accomplished explorer. He had been the first Englishman to enter Mecca disguised as a Muslim, a, a journey that few others had either the skill or the audacity to make. He spoke more than 25 different languages, everything from French and German to Hindustani, Armenian, Turkish, Swahili, and he was an extraordinarily gifted and prolific writer, writing dozens of books, essays, poems, translations, but no matter what he accomplished, he was always considered an outsider in England, always looked upon with suspicion and distrust. He'd been born in Devon, two British parents, but he was raised in Europe, moving 13 times before his 18th birthday, from France to Italy to Greece, effortlessly picking up languages and cultures along the way. He had also grown up fighting from street brawls to school skirmishes to violent encounters with enraged tutors. In fact, the only childhood teacher Burton had respected was his fencing master, a former soldier who only had one thumb, having lost the other in battle. The lessons paid off, eventually turning Burton into one of the most skilled swordsmen in Europe. He had attended Oxford, but he was bullied and bored there and ended up engineering his own expulsion. Then he joined the Bombay Native Infantry and moved to India, where he learned 12 languages in seven years. What Burton didn't have was a title or money or even a religious affiliation. On the contrary, he was openly, emphatically agnostic, studying every religion and respecting none. He was that most alarming of figures to Victorian Britons, a hedonistic man in a puritanical age. He enthusiastically tried every hallucinogen he came across, from opium to bang. He allowed and even encouraged wild stories of sexual exploits and even murder to circulate about him unchecked. And he translated into English works of literature from the Arabian Nights to the Kama Sutra that scandalized and secretly thrilled his fellow countrymen. Burton also had the fatal flaw of not looking particularly British in the eyes of his countrymen. He had his father's black hair and piercing black eyes, which he was said to use to hypnotize women, reportedly to great effect. And he had an absolutely unforgettable face. None other than Bram Stoker, who would go on to write Dracula, was obsessed with him. 
The man riveted my attention, Stoker wrote after meeting Burton. He was dark and forceful and masterful and ruthless. I never saw anyone like him. He is steel. He would go through you like a sword. Stoker was especially fascinated by Burton's teeth, writing that when Burton talked, his canine tooth showed its full length like the gleam of a dagger. <laughs> Burton's second in command was a man who was as unremarkable as Burton was extraordinary, his complete opposite in nearly every way. John Hanning Speak was everything Britons expected their heroes to be. He was blonde and blue-eyed. He had been born into the aristocracy. He was an officer in the British Army. He was puritanical and prim, priding himself on his discipline and judging others harshly if, in his eyes, they fell short. While Burton buried himself in books, Speak devoted himself to hunting planning to open a natural history museum in his ancestral home. Speak was also deeply, dangerously resentful of his commander, a festering bitterness that remained unspoken for years, building with each offense Burton unknowingly gave, each achievement or accolade that Burton received and Speak did not. For years, Speak simmered with barely contained anger and envy, until finally it boiled over, leaving Burton shocked and bewildered, and in the end, destroying them both. Burton had not chosen Speak as his second in command because he admired or even liked him, but because he felt he owed him. The two men had met a year earlier in Aden as Burton was about to embark on his first search for the source of the Nile. Just before the expedition was about to leave for Somaliland, Burton had learned that one member of his expedition, a close friend and valued companion, had died suddenly. Speak happened to be in Aden at the same time on a hunting trip, and he asked Burton if he could join his expedition. Burton had known that he was taking a risk. Worrying that Speak could not speak Arabic or any African languages and seemed to have little knowledge of or interest in the people whose land they would be traveling through. But despite his reservations, he had taken pity on Speak, allowing him to join the expedition. I saw that he was going to lose his money and his life, Burton would later write of Speak, marveling at his own disastrous decision. Why should I have cared? I do not know. That first expedition, however, had ended even before it began. Soon after arriving in Somaliland, their camp had been attacked in the middle of the night. By morning, one member of the expedition was dead. Speak was barely alive after suffering, suffering 11 stab wounds. And Burton had a javelin thrust through his jaw, impaling him from cheek to cheek and leaving him with a long, jagged scar down the side of his face, only adding to his reputation as a strange and dangerous man. This shared tragedy had made it impossible for Burton to choose another man for his next expedition. When Burton and Speak returned to East Africa in 1856 with the newly formed East African expedition, they began this time in Zanzibar. 20 miles off the coast of modern-day Tanzania, the island had been occupied for at least 17,000 years before the first European, the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama, had landed there more than 350 years earlier. Da Gama had immediately realized what Africans and Arabs had long known. With a harbor that was both protected and easily defended, Zanzibar was a perfect launching pad for trade and exploration. It was also one of the most active slave markets in the world. Thousands of people were brought to Zanzibar in chains every year, sold for four to five pounds for a man, slightly more for a woman. Burton and Speak, like most of their contemporaries, were unapologetic in their racism with all of its attendant arrogance and ignorance. 
but they were sickened by the slave trade, which, Burton wrote, had made the island an admirable training ground for damnation. No one knew this shameful and painful history more intimately than the man who was about to become the most important member of Burton's expedition, and arguably the most accomplished guide in the history of African exploration, Sidi Mubarak Bombay. Kidnapped from his village in East Africa when he was just a child, Bombay had been dragged to the coast and taken to Zanzibar, where he had been sold for cloth. And then he had been forced onto a ship traveling to India, where he had been enslaved for some 20 years. Finally freed when the man who owned him died, he had made his way back to the continent of his birth, where he met Burton and Speak. Bombay quickly became the heart, and in many ways, the hero of Burton's expedition. For Speak, Bombay was his porter and translator, but really his only friend. Bombay spoke Hindi as well as Swahili and Arabic, and he could understand the Anglo-Hindi that Speak had picked up in India. Before they met Bombay, Burton had been the only person Speak could talk to, leaving him feeling completely isolated from everyone else in the expedition and even more resentful of Burton, who was daily having animated conversations in Arabic and Swahili with the other men. The more resentful Speak became of Burton, the more heavily he relied on Bombay. But Bombay was important not just to Speak, but to Burton and to the expedition as a whole. He was the linchpin that kept them connected. The caravan leader, porter, mediator, nurse, even after losing everything he knew and loved and being enslaved for decades, Bombay had somehow emerged from that staggering tragedy, not with bitterness, but with kindness. He was soft-hearted, patient, hardworking, and generous to a fault. He would also go on to achieve what Burton and Speak would never be able to do, even with all their resources, advantages, and ambition. Arguably, Bombay would do more to help map East Africa than any European explorer ever to enter his homeland. Not only did he travel with Burton and Speak to Lake Tanganyika, which Burton hoped was the source of the Nile, but he was with Speak when, in a brutal twist of fate, he, and not Burton, became the first European to reach the Nyanza, the largest lake in Africa and the actual source of the White Nile which Speak would name for his own queen, Victoria. Then, a year later, Burton returned to the Nyanza with Speak and James Grant. Then, he helped Henry Morton Stanley find David Livingston. You know, Dr. Livingston, I presume? That was Bombay. And then, with Vernie Lovett Cameron, Bombay became the first to cross the entire continent from east to, east, from east to west, C to C. The last person I have to mention was central to Burton's life, but not to the, ex the search for the source of the White Nile or to any major expedition, but not because she didn't want to be or because she didn't have the strength, intelligence, or determination required for such a difficult undertaking. She wasn't part of the expedition because she wasn't welcome, because she was a woman living in the 19th century. Isabel Arundel had been raised by a controlling mother in a strict, fervently religious, aristocratic family. She was related to Sir Thomas Arundel, a distant cousin of both Henry VIII and the two wives he beheaded, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. But she dreamed of a very different kind of life, one of freedom and adventure. I long to rush around the world in an express, she wrote. I feel as if I shall go mad if I remain at home. What others dare, I can dare. And why should I not? Why should we not have some useful, active life? Why, with spirit, brains, and energies, are women to exist upon worsted work and household accounts? It makes me sick 
and I will not do it. In short, Isabel dreamed of being a man. Specifically, she dreamed of being Richard Burton. I wish I were a man, she wrote. If I were, I would be Richard Burton. But as I'm a woman, I would be Richard Burton's wife. A decade younger than Burton, almost to the day, Isabel waited nine years to marry him. She sat at home, fearing for his life, while he went to Mecca, to Aden, to Somaliland, to the Crimean War, and then back to East Africa in search of the source. By the time Burton finally came home to marry Isabel, she was 29 years old, an old maid in the Victorian age. But she had spent those years not just waiting to be his wife, but preparing for it. She read everything he wrote. She learned how to ride a horse and to edit his manuscripts, a job that he required of her. She even learned to fence, fervently hoping that one day she would be called upon to save her husband's life. <laughs> Isabel was and would always be passionately, even obsessively devoted to Burton, building her life around him, abandoning her own dreams to fulfill his. I am glad to say that there was only one will in the house, and that was his, she would write. I was only too lucky to have met my master. In the end, however, Isabel would decide that her greatest duty to her husband was not to defend his life, but to save his soul. Tragically, she believed that the only way to do that was to destroy his work. Isabel's story, like that of Burton's and Speaks, is a cautionary tale. Beware obsession in all its many dangerous forms. In fact, Danger is a recurring theme in this book, the danger of crossing thousands of miles of unmapped land, of enduring fatal diseases, slow starvation, and sudden attack, the danger of obsession and envy, of being blinded by an ambition and a hatred so deeply rooted that it destroys both its target and its bearer. But most of all, this is a story of the danger of arrogance, of believing that you can discover a land that had been inhabited by millions of people for thousands of years before London or Paris, that you understand a continent better than the people who live there, and that you can somehow improve their lives by seizing their land and their resources, appropriating their history and their culture. If we can learn anything from the past, from humankind's greatest achievements and most devastating mistakes. From our most revered heroes and despised villains, it is that arrogance and ignorance always go together, hand in hand. And the only way to free ourselves from their terrible legacy is to keep a clear and steady eye on our history and to use that knowledge again and again to correct our course. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Here's your phone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. This is so exciting to see so many people. And it's put me in a kind of a confessional <laughs> mood. Um, <laughs> while I listened to you, I started thinking about how when I think of an expedition that happened 150 plus years in the past, I, I realize I have a tendency to kind of go, okay, there are these guys and they wanted to find something and, and it was really awful finding it um, and they got really sick and then they found it at the end. <laughs> but, but all the wonderful parts of your book are in the details. Um, and so this, these weren't people who threw some granola bars in their pocket right. and strapped on their Gore-Tex boots. Right. Um, what did they have with them? Will you talk about that? I know that in one of the first expeditions you write about, um, they had 50 camels. 50 camels to take with them. <laughs> what are some of the other items that they brought along? Well, as I said, I mean, I think that one of the things you have to kind of wrap your mind around when you think about these expeditions um, is for how far they went. Again, it's more than a thousand miles. Um, and they spent years traveling. So they had to, and they had to bring a lot of their 
supplies with them. So they brought some, you know, of obviously their scientific instruments and things um, from the UK, but they, um, but they, they went to Zanzibar to go to their markets and to buy food and to buy currency, the currency that they would use, which ranged from beads to, to cloth to wires. Um, and so, and obviously they wanted something, that the lighter the better, the smaller the better, that, because they would have to haul them. They had to hire as many um, porters as they could, find as many donkeys as they could to, to um, carry all of these. And it was a danger um, of bringing not just not enough stuff, but the wrong things, right? So even the beads, if you had the wrong color, you're out of luck, you know, and you could easily starve to death because you brought the wrong kind of cloth or you brought the wrong color of beads. Um, and it, but if you had the right kinds, then that would really pave your way and it could also help um, uh, if there were disputes or things like that, you also, you know, were paying your men along the way, so um, there was just a lot, a lot of, of danger involved in just in choosing what you were gonna wear and what you are gonna bring um, with you. And you know, you talk about, we, we, we know these stories of, of exploration, we know the successful stories. We don't usually know all the stories that ended in death. You know, a lot, a lot of these people went and never came back. And so these are the stories as horrible as they seem, and they did endure horrible, horrible things, um, these are the stories um, that, are success that were successful and that then become part of our history. That's surprising to hear because, I mean, there are so many times in this book where you say, well, he, Burton hoped to have 170 men, mm -hmm. but he got 36. Right. <laughs> Burton right. hoped to have, you know, he thought he was, he had a year's worth of supplies, mm -hmm. but after three months he said, oh no, they're half gone now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is, I, I would just had a really hard time understanding that and then understanding the funding, mm -hmm. that it seemed like a whole lot of that was due to lack of funding, and yet these were enormous expeditions, these were ex expeditions um, that were planned for years in advance, like you said, mm -hmm. and they were backed by the Royal Geographical Society mm -hmm. and you know, heavily debated about who the commander should be. Mm -hmm. So what, can you talk about the funding? What was going on? Why would they only give someone, you know, a hundred or a thousand, it was a thousand pounds mm -hmm. for one of them, right? right Which would right. be what t today? Any idea? <laughs> not much, not, not much. much. I mean, like What was going on there? So, yeah, and also, I mean, not only, again, this is a mystery that had captivated human beings for thousands of years, right? And this is, and, and as we know, the legacy of these expeditions, I mean, it's not just the Royal Geographical say, Society saying, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to fill in the map of the world? It's the, the British Empire saying, let's get there first so we can colonize it, let's find out what resources they have, and let's you know, plant our flag. And so obviously there was, there was a lot of interest from a lot of high-powered people that this would be a, a success. Um, but yeah, they're always, always trying to find ways to not give them much money. And the Royal Geographical Society itself, even though it was, again, the most powerful scientific society, and it had all these famous members, very few of them wanted to pay their dues. You know, they just like, no, you know. And so it was always really hard just to get them to pay the dues so they could, you know, pay their rent, you know, and keep the map collection going and things like that. And so they really had to, they had to, you know, ask the treasury, could you please, you know, give them, give us a couple more hundred pounds. And literally they're asking their members, yeah, hey, could everybody reach in your pockets and give us 20 pounds, you know. And so I just at every point, and, and these explorers, especially somebody uh, like Richard Burton, who absolutely knew what he was going to be up against and what he would need and the, the, the time and, and difficulty that this expedition would entail, um, you know, saying it's, it's not going to work unless you give us more funding. They just really couldn't. It was always, always, always a struggle. And they went anyway, and Burton yeah. shelled out his own money. Yeah. And and they, uh, it's, 
often did. That yeah. also, so much about <clears throat> this is hard to, to comprehend. So that was another thing. Right. And then um, you mentioned there the diseases that they encountered mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. the way, which were so fascinating. And, and, I, and in a lot of cases, you would stop in, in your narrative and say, well, and this is what it actually was. You'd mm -hmm. consulted a doctor um, after you've given the description. But then there were things like, um, Speak had something called that they call little irons, little irons. and yeah. um, and so at one point the remedy was that Bombay had to take Speak's right arm and put it behind his head and had him hold his left ear from behind and that was supposed <laughs> to help. And there was something else Speak had where he thought, oh, I know how I'll get relief. I'll jam a gigantic needle in my side. Uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. So so are these? What can you talk about some of the diseases you figured out what they actually were? Well, obviously, um, you know, a lot of the diseases that we know today, malaria was a, a huge threat. Um, Burton had such severe malaria that he was paralyzed for almost a year. He couldn't walk. He couldn't even use his hands. You know, he was always writing. He couldn't, he couldn't hold a pen for almost a year, was paralyzed with this. They both, both men um, were blinded for months at a time um, just with horrible um, eye infections. Um, and, and one of the most incredible stories to me um, happened to speak. One night he was in his tent, there was a big storm, and uh, it knocked his tent down. And so to um, raise his tent back up, he lit a candle. And immediately his tent was filled with beetles, just hundreds of beetles. And he you know, flailed around trying to get rid of them. And he finally, just out of pure exhaustion, just gave up. And he laid down to sleep, and he felt a beetle crawling in his ear. And it was, it was burrowing deeper and deeper into his ear and sort of getting angry because it couldn't get out, and deeper and deeper. And so he tried everything. You know, he tried butter and oil and salt, pouring in his ear, trying to get rid of it. And finally, out of desperation, he took a pen knife, and he jabbed it into his ear, and he, um, and he deafened himself for the rest of his life in that, in that ear. And even the weeks or weeks afterwards, he had this string of boils that sort of his, his, sh his shoulder was clenched up, and he, he was making these strange faces, and he couldn't eat. And little bits of the beetle were coming out in its earwax, like a leg and a, and a wing. I was hoping you'd <laughs> tell the <this> story. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you all got what you came for. <laughs> um, well, um, yeah. so I, I also wondered what you've learned about modern expeditions. Um, you write that in 2006, somebody navigate, circumnavigated the Nyanza, the river, I mean the, the lake, and discovered more about the headwaters of the Nile. And so, you know, I assume that that person's expedition was in no way similar <laughs> to Burton and Speaks. Well, it's obviously you're going to have modern equipment. You know, even uh, for me when I was there or, you know, years ago when I wrote about Theodore Roosevelt in the Amazon, I went to this still very, very remote river um, <clears throat> called the Rio Roosevelt today. Um, I, you know, I had a GPS and I had a satellite phone and, and things like that, which obviously make it, make it easier. But is, these are still dangerous places in certain ways. Um, and, and for instance, um, when I was in the Amazon, um, you know, I heard about a man who had escaped from a, a prison and had, uh, that was close, into the, close to the rainforest and he was dead within an hour or two. He had stepped on a poisonous snake. Um, uh, there, there was, unfortunately, um, there were two National Geographic photographers um, uh, who were freelance photographers who were there just a few months after I was, and they died in a plane crash over the Rio Negro. So, um, and, 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 um, and East Africa, you know, is, still has its challenges, especially if you're trying to, again, go long distances. A lot of the areas are, are not populated. Um, and so, and there are, there are lions, you know, I mean, there are, there are um, things that, and there are diseases that still, you know, not all of our um, vaccinations are going to protect us against. So um, it's still, and certainly a, a journey like that is still, still taking a chance, yeah. 
But those aren't the only problematic parts about any, uh, any sort of exploration, right? I mean, you, you talk about um, <clears throat> what ends up being um, almost cultural appropriation or like, mm -hmm. like in some, what, geographic appropriation or something like that, you know, taking a, a lake like Nyanza and mm -hmm. calling it Queen Victoria and then disregard, disregarding the local people who mm -hmm. already know about all of these features. Mm -hmm. um, so where is... Um, exploration now and and I think you wrote that the national or the um, Royal Geographical Society has done things to try to rectify that sort of I, I don't mm -hmm. know what to call it um, just being blind to other cultures right so how does that right. work with exploration well, now obviously at the time um, again you have these um, these armchair geographers these gentlemen scientists who had never been anywhere near Africa, but felt very confident to pontificate about it and, and say what they believe was the geography of it. And, um, but these explorers would go and they would know, I mean, they're going to Zanzibar uh, not just to buy supplies and to prepare for the expedition or, and, and to hire porters, but to find guides, right? And to find the people who know. And there are obviously many, many Africans who had worked as, um, a, you know, they were ivory or, or slave traders, they were messengers, and they had traveled long, long distances, and they, they knew their land very well, and so these explorers would go to them immediately to get their bearings. I mean, it was the obvious, the obvious and smart thing to do, um, but by the time they made their way back to England, their reports were pretty much scrubbed of these, um, what, what the British would call local informants, because they didn't, have any respect for them, you know, they, they, they questioned anything, well, you know, he lives there, how can he possibly know, <laughs> right? And, um, and so uh, that has changed, that has changed, um, and I give the Royal Geographical Society a lot of credit, so they have put on exhibitions about, about guides, there's a, um, and uh, City Mubarak Bombay was a big part of that and accompanying um, books and lectures and things like that. So there is, an, um, there is a real attempt to be honest um, about um, how these ex expeditions really happened, how these explorers survived, and much less came out with um, all this knowledge that helped to fill in our maps. So yeah, it has changed. Um, but some things seem to stay the same. Um, we have... Um, you know, Burton wrote and published a whole lot of stuff, and a lot of it was really risque um, mm -hmm. for the day, and I guess probably now also. You write about um, how in 1857 the British government passed the Obscene Publications Act. Do you know where I'm heading? <laughs> um, so, so just yesterday um, in Missouri, um, SB 775 went into effect, criminalizing sexually explicit materials in schools. Um, and so it feels like... Sure. <laughs> so a lot, a lot has yeah. changed, um, right. but then, I mean, that was 165 years ago. Right, um, right. And, and we're kind of back in that, or we never left that boat, but we're back <laughs> in a boat. Well, I think, um, you know, it's an old story. Things, things get better, but not as quickly as we'd like, and um, we can make steps forward, and sometimes um, we, go, we go backwards. Um, and, you know, we can all certainly decide... Um, for ourselves and our, our children, um, what we want them exposed to. But I think um, in general, um, my opinion is that um, we need to have open and free expression. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, uh, Richard Burton certainly uh, fought for that and he was angry and he said, you know, um, when there was a threat of his own writings um, being banned, he said that he was going to go in with his Bible and his Shakespeare under his arm and say, you know, if they want to um, ban my work, then they're also going to have to ban these. Um, right, and they so. had, and at the time, George Eliot was under attack from this. And then, right, right, And you right. write that the same thing was happening in the United States and in France. So, right. you know, it was Flaubert, it was Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. It was these people, you know, today, you know, we, we cherish their work. It's, it's upstairs. Right, right um, sure. And we continue to read it. it. Um, classics, yeah. Right. And so, you know, the, the, we're about to celebrate um, the 150th birthday of the Kansas City Public Library <laughs> soon. And so, thank you.
Um, and so, you know, this was, a, this was an act that passed 165 years ago. So, you know, for almost that entire time, the Kansas City Public Library has been with us and really working to safeguard um, against that sort of censorship. Um, mm -hmm. Will you talk about the place of libraries since you're here in a library, um, you know, as far as sure. all of this goes? Yeah, as I said, I'm a, I'm a product of libraries, as so many of you are, I'm sure, as well. I, I grew up in a, a small blue-collar town in Ohio, um, and, and the center of my life was my local library. I could, I could walk there from where I lived, and I spent um, many, many of my days there. Um, my uh, family, we didn't buy um, maybe any books, but we always had books in our house because we always went to the library, my parents, my sisters, um, all of us. And um, so for me um, personally, you know, I, I didn't know any writers. I didn't know anyone who was a writer, so it never occurred to me that I could be a writer, but I just knew that I loved to read, and so I thought maybe I'll be a teacher or maybe I'll be a librarian. And I would have loved, um, I would have loved that job, to not just to be surrounded by books myself, but be able to share books with, um, with my community. And um, to me, that's the role of a library, is being a community center. And it's been so exciting to me also to watch, you know, I, I, I started writing books um, 20 years ago and, um, and then, you know, traveling on book tours and things. And, and I used to always worry about libraries because I love them so much. Um, I thought, oh, well, people are going to stop going to libraries. Um, but, but the opposite has been true, as you all know um, better than I do. I mean, um, libraries have become the center of our communities. You know, they're not just where you go to get a book, but it's where you go to an event, that's where you go to see local art, that's where you go to, you know, if, you, if you've lost your job, to go get training or even rent a tie or, or, or borrow a tie. You know, they're just, uh, it's where we bring our children for story hour. I mean, they, they, they're so, so essential, I think, to uh, a, a, a rich and vibrant and diverse and active and, and close um, community. Um, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I would like to open it up to all of you to have a chance to ask her a few questions. Um, so if you would, for our audience at home, um, so they can hear you, if you'd step up to the microphone with your excellently, perfectly formed questions, <laughs> not just comments, and we'll take them. And then I will also be paying attention to the YouTube comments so that I can ask her questions people are asking from home. And, and we will do this for about 15 minutes. Go ahead, sir. So uh, two of the most famous African explorers I'm familiar with are Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, okay. uh, I enjoy research. So I'd like to hear about some of the research that you did and some surprises that popped up that you said, oh, really? <laughs> I would, that's a great question. Thank you. I enjoy research as well. I love, it's, in fact, it's my favorite, favorite part of this job. I, it usually takes me about five years to write a book, and 80% um, and of that time is, is doing research. So obviously, Pretty early on, I went to the UK. Um, I was in uh, at the um, National Library of Scotland in Edinburgh. A lot of time in, in, in London at the Royal Geographical Society, the British Library, Royal Asiatic Society. And I even went um, just outside of London and um, just near Bath um, was the scene of this, this, this book, this story builds up to this really shocking, tragic event which I won't tell you about. I'll let you find out for yourself, hopefully. And, um, and I went to where that event played out. Um, but obviously, the whole time I'm planning and looking forward to going to East Africa. I had been to East Africa um, earlier when I worked at National Geographic. I had done a story about the Kingdom of Aksum. So I'd been in Ethiopia. Um, so I, I was really looking forward to it. And it, it takes a lot of planning, this kind of trip, because it's expensive. There are a lot of things you need to get while you're there. There are a lot of things that you can't really anticipate that, that might happen while, while you're there. And also, I have three kids. They're getting older now, but they, at the time, they're all at home. My, my parents would have to come from Florida to stay with us. And so there's a lot of planning. So it took me a while, but I finally um, 
settled on a date, uh, which I thought was really a great date. It was February 2020. And um, so obviously it turned out to not be such a great date. But, um, so, but I didn't know at that time, it really, um, COVID was really just in China and a little bit in Italy and Iran. It wasn't a big deal here yet, so I thought it would be fine. Um, so uh, I, went to, I went to Kenya, my husband came with me. He, was, uh, he used to be a foreign correspondent, a war correspondent for the New York Times, so he's useful to have around. So he, um, he came with me, we went to Kenya, we went to Zanzibar, um, which was just as extraordinary. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Zanzibar, but if you haven't and you have the opportunity, please go, because it's just it's rich with history and with every color and smell and sight that you can imagine and sound. Um, and then I, I went across um, to mainland Tanzania, and I went all the way west to Lake Tanganyika, which, as I said, Burton hoped was the source of the Nile, and they became the first Europeans to reach that lake. And, um, and it's huge. It, it's absolutely huge. So it's um, an, an incredible, I, I think it's the deepest lake in the world. It's, it's 4,000 feet deep, and it's this long kind of scar. But um, I, I went, and Jane Goodall's um, research um, camp, Gombe, is there on one, on one of the um, shores, one of the banks. Um, and one night, I needed to get across to the other bank, and there's, um, this, there had been this big storm. And so the boat I'm waiting for was late and hour after hour going by and waiting and it's getting later and later and it's dark by the time it comes. And the, and the water was really, really rough. And this boat is, it's small. It's like, it can maybe fit eight people. It's wooden, it's open. And this is like being on a storm-tossed sea on, in this little boat. And, um, and so we're going and it's an hours long trip and it's so, I've never been in a situation like this where the, the, the boat was literally tipping all the way over and all the way over. And I was, frankly, I was terrified. And I said to my husband, I was like, look, look how far the other bank is. I was like, if we capsize, there's no way we can swim that far. We can't make it. And he said, um, don't worry about it. The crocodiles will eat us before we get there. <laughs> it was true. It was packed with crocodiles. Um, but we survived and then uh, went back um, east and then north to um, the, the southern reaches of the Nyanza or, or Lake Victoria. And, and again, uh, the Nyanza is um, the largest lake in Africa, the second largest lake in the world. It's 26,000 square miles. I mean, it's an area of 26,000 square miles. It's just mind-bendingly huge. Um, and the, uh, and, and the, the Nile pours out of it in its northern reaches. So um, when Speak first went with Bombay, he saw it from the southern reaches, and he was only there for a couple of days, but he just said, I know this is it. I know that this is the source. And he had absolutely no evidence, but he just, you know, he wanted it to be true, and he was lucky, and he was right. Um, but I did go then to the northern, and I saw the, the Nile pouring out of the, of the Nyanza, which is one of these moments that you'll never forget. Please, sir. Uh, it seems like there must be uh, a lot of parallels between this expedition and the Lewis and Clark mm. expedition. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that era of exploration and, and so forth? Right. I, 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 um, you know, it, it, it's one of these interesting things, and I, I think that's a, a, a really thoughtful um, comment, you know, uh, yes, obviously, um, they're very dangerous. Um, they have no idea. Um, you know, th these guys, again, everyone thought at first that the interior of Africa was just a big desert. And then these German missionary scores were like, no, it's one huge lake. Well, there are actually four huge lakes um, in that region, but they, they're going in completely blind, really. They don't, they don't know um, what's, what's ahead of them. Um, and it's dangerous, um, uh, and it's uh, exciting, and there's all of this potential, but there's also a, a legacy, um, as we were talking about, and, um, and with anything, I mean, I think that, uh, obviously, I find these stories of, of exploration fascinating. I was steeped in them um, when I worked at National Geographic, 
Um, but I think we also have to be very, very honest about the legacy and just, um, and honestly, I, before I started working this, I didn't really think about that the, the, not just the direct result of these expeditions, but the intended result of these expeditions um, was colonization. And, um, and, so, and so as long as we're honest about that and we can, we can talk about our history and we can um, appreciate the, the courage that went into it, um, not just from the European explorers or the North American explorers, but the people who also lived there, who lived um, where, that, where was what was being explored and, um, and you know, either benefited or, um, or were hurt by it. So definitely, I think any kind of exploration, there are very interesting parallels, yeah. And we have a couple quick things from our YouTube audience. Mm -hmm. One very important one is candy. Thanks for this, <laughs> mom and dad. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mom and dad. Okay. <laughs> and another one is um, River of Gods versus River of Doubt. Which mm -hmm. expedition do you think would win in a modern day reality show like Survivor? <laughs> <laughs> that is very interesting. Um, yeah, they're actually different. You know, it, it's one of these things. I think, you know, I, I knew when I started writing this book, I thought it'll be like, oh, another river. Just writing about another river, um, another, but um, but they're actually very, very. Um, the river doesn't really factor yeah. into this book. I mean, there's not yeah, a lot of about, river. It's about the source, right? Yeah. It's about the source. But um, I don't know for sheer brutality. I mean, I guess you could say so. On one hand, River of Doubt, we have um, drowning and murder, and Roosevelt nearly taking his own life. On the other hand, we have the beetle in the ear, so I don't know, you, you pick your poison. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll head over here. I know you've been waiting, sir, and then we'll take yours, and, um, and then we'll do our signing. To, to go back to the question of funding and mm -hmm. then pick up on the Lewis and Clark thing, were the Americans the only one who the government got involved in this stuff? Where, where is the English DARPA at this time? <laughs> Didn't they see this as a military advantage and or was it this sense that you had to be a gentleman and you couldn't, you know, you had to self-fund? Mm -hmm. Where was the government during this whole thing? Well, as I said, yeah, the government was very, very interested in these expeditions and the outcome of them and then the information that they would bring back with them and the potential for, for colonization. Um, but they didn't want to spend the money, you know. I mean, they, they gave um, sort of reluctantly and begrudgingly um, to fund these expeditions. Yeah, I think essentially they thought, look, if, if you come back alive and you're right, then you're gonna have all of this opportunity and you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, your name will be continued throughout history. So it was a prestige they believed and so they thought, you know, then you can figure it out for yourself. So they did a little bit of funding but not nearly, not nearly what they needed. And then Speak didn't end up going down in history the way yeah, he thought. Interesting. And that was a very yeah. sad part of the story, too. Yeah. Um, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, how do you go about deciding what book to write? I mean, you've done four incredible books so okay. far, two rivers. So I was thinking, oh, it's about <laughs> rivers, right? Yeah. No, there's an assassination in the Boer War. But uh, so many things to write about. What's the process you go through when you decide, okay, my next project is this? Um, and that, to me, is really the most important part of the process, is choosing the idea. Um, there are a lot of great ideas, and, um, and I've had a lot of ideas that, I've had two different ideas that I spent a year uh, working on and finally uh, walked away from. And the, and the main thing, obviously, you need a great story, um, you need a lot of really great characters, um, but you also need a ton of primary source material. So with narrative nonfiction, you need to have dialogue, you need to have um, all those little details that you hope really bring a story to life. I always say, because I, I love to read, I'm constantly, my kids make fun of me because they're like, you have no hobbies. All you do is, is read. That's, if I have free time, I want to read. And when I read, I want a story that will just suck me in, that I will forget where I am, what I'm doing, who I am, and just com be completely involved in the story. And that's, 
the kind of book that I try to write, and you can't do that unless you have just, you're just drowning in letters and diaries and newspaper accounts and um, firsthand um, books. And so, um, and so that's the thing that matters to me most. I'll tell you a, a quick story. Um, one of the stories that I really fell in love with and I wanted to write a book about was about Benjamin Franklin. And I had just been, I read this article, I found this article about the house that he lived in in London uh, for almost 18 years. It was right before the Revolutionary War, and it had been abandoned, and um, squatters were living in it. And so the friends, this organization of friends of Benjamin Franklin bought it, and they were renovating it. And they had these guys working in the basement, and they were digging, and they found a bone. And they found another bone, another bone. They found up finding 1,200 human bones in this basement. And they called the police, and the police took a look at them and they're like, these are really old bones. So they got a forensic anthropologist to look at them. And these bones date to exactly the time when Benjamin Franklin lived in this house. So you're thinking, founding father serial murderer? What, you know, what's happening? So um, what happened was, so he rented two floors of this house um, from a woman, a widow and her daughter, Polly. And Polly man married a man named Matthew Hewson who was a doctor and an anatomist at a time when it was illegal to perform autopsies. So they literally, they had a tunnel leading from this house, it was near the Thames, to the Thames, and they would hire these resurrection men, these grave robbers, to, and they would bring in bodies, or just over the garden wall was a gallows, and at that time you could be hanged for any of 400 different offenses. You open somebody's letter, you're going to be hanged. <laughs> and and you would, then your, your family would have to pay for the hanging. So they would go and make a deal with them, like, look, okay, you're going to die tomorrow, so I'll tell you what, I will give you a new set of clothes, and I'll pay your fees if I can have your body after you die. So, so they were there in this basement performing these autopsies, and then right before... Benjamin Franklin gets kicked out. He realizes he's wrong because he had been a loyalist. He's realized he's wrong. We need to have the revolution. So he's been kicked out of England. Matthew, who's become a son to him, cuts himself during an autopsy and he dies from septicemia. And so Franklin moves back to Philadelphia and Polly, who's, who's pregnant with their third child, comes with him. And they move to Philadelphia and she raises her children and they become doctors as well and they're still there. And so, and you can go now, they've, they've, they've completed the house. If you're in London, you can go to the Benjamin Franklin house and a, a, a poly reenactor will give you, give you your tour of the place. And you can see there's a, a hole with like a plexiglass shield and you can see some of the bones there. Um, so it's just great, it's a British Enlightenment. Um, the, the address, this is gonna be my title, 37 Craven Street. So it's just so, so good, right? The whole thing, and he's friends with Erasmus Darwin. And, and I know, I know Benjamin Franklin was there. You know he was there. He was a scientist. He was fascinated by, um, by medicine. There were no medical schools in the United States. He was bringing young men to study with him there. Um, but I can't prove that he was there. So I, I, I tracked down these family members. I was like, please tell me that you have a diary that nobody knows about. And was, you know, where he's, Matthew Houston's like, you know, Benjamin and I were down doing an autopsy. <laughs> um, he said this and I said this, um, but they don't have it. So um, nobody else steal my idea because I might still <laughs> write it sometime. I will track you down. Um, but anyway, but that's just an example. So again, a year, I worked on that for a year and I finally had to walk away because I just, you know, it's gotta be totally factual. You've gotta be able to prove everything you say and it's gotta be a great story. So that's- and So you're famously tight-lipped about your next project. So <laughs> any chance you'll leak something to us today? Um, well, the, to me, the most exciting thing, and I'm very, very excited about this idea, is the central character is a woman, which has been really, really hard for me. Thank you, thanks. Well, I, as I've said, so women have obviously done fascinating, extraordinary things throughout history, but other people weren't writing about them. 
It was very rare to find that. Like when I wrote about Winston Churchill, he was only 24, 25 years old when he was in the Boer War, but other people were paying attention. You know, everyone was watching him. They were like, I can't stand that kid, Winston Churchill, but he's going to be prime minister one day. And so they were writing about him. And so I have not just what he wrote, but all the people around him watching him. So I can describe that. And that's very hard to find, unfortunately, for a woman. Um, but I think I found it. So wish me luck. All right, we have about 10 books left out in the lobby for purchase, if anyone's interested. And um, Candace will stay up here on the stage and sign some books if you'd like to form a line in just a moment, starting over that direction. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming.